couple of them in particular. Cascades is, of course, uh, like a native language, like all of the design tenants have been specifically baked in in the Cascades platform. And then also to, uh, into WebWorks, WebWorks also follows a lot of those design principles. Um, so although the design principles will apply to any one of those runtime frameworks, uh, Cascades is really the uh, manifestation of those design principles within control. And it's a, a, key, fo a key way to be able to, uh, to enable that and to use that. And so I think probably we'll probably be speaking primarily to Cascades as well as an example. But just a note to say that it, it really applies to any one of them. Um, so the one thing, actually this is a slide that Megan gave me. It's from <laughs> a Macadamian blog. Uh, and it sort of shows this is a, uh, like a designer and a developer. Um, and sort of, I, I love this slide. This speaks to my history. This speaks to what I know. Um, but uh, there are really, a designer and developer are really often looking at the exact same problem from an entirely different perspective and using it in an entirely different language. Um, in my experience, there, that creates some tension um, and it, sometimes it, it's not a good tension and can cause contention. But there's something of, actually, I gotta say, in my experience, a lot of the very best things that I have ever been a part of have come from a tension between those two perspectives. Somebody looking from it from a design aesthetic and working along with somebody with a technological uh, point of view. And when those things work very well, then magic happens. Um, and there's real opportunity there. And it's actually, it's been an interest of mine how, how infrequently that tends to happen. Uh, the process that I've seen when I, a lot of times when I've seen it break down, the process that seems to be followed is you take a designer like Megan, who is working on what something they want to, to envision, something that they want to be able to bring in. And so they will often, if you look at designers, they'll often they'll think about materials, they'll think about inspirations, they'll uh, blue the sky, they'll, they'll think about things that they want to create. They'll use rich tools, they'll use uh, professional drawing tools, Photoshop tools, uh, presentation tools, and they'll live inside their designs. And then they'll take all that rich study um, and understanding of what they want to be able to create, and they will take all of that rich, vibrant information and publish it in, into a uh, paper document. There's always something interesting to me about those paper documents that get produced. Um, often, it seems the processes that we use, we take all that information, we put it into a paper document. Those paper documents, um, they often look really good. Uh, they often, they look really good, especially on the big, when you put them on a big, great big screen like this and you show some of the screens, they can look really good. But there are a lot of the magic of a mobile interface, of the interaction, of the clarity, of how things move together, all the things that we know to be very important in terms of mobile design, in terms of mobile experience, somehow get lost when you take all of that rich information and you serialize it into a document and ship it off. So I work with a lot of developers I, I've had the opportunity to work with a lot of different application teams, both inside and outside of RIM. And uh, so when, a lot of times when the developer, somebody like Dan, gets that document, um, first thing that they often do is they look at the document and they, it, I've seen it where they, like, I, I've experienced this myself and I've seen it a lot where you go, what? Uh, this doesn't make any sense. Um, sometimes, it, a lot of the times the reaction is, I don't think the designer understands how this code needs to work. Um, and there's something missing here. And, uh, and sometimes there's a barrier between those two people, either by time or space, and there's no opportunity to interact back and forth. And so, they'll, but they have no opportunity to communicate back, and the designers are the designers are supposed to do what they say, so, all right, I'm gonna publish some code. Um, and so you take the spirit of what's in that paper document, and then you publish it, and then you send it back to your designer, and the designer, a little while later, gets to see the document, and then their initial reaction is, uh, what? <laughs> that does, that they don't know, what, yeah, what is that? Um, that doesn't make any sense. We've got a real problem here. Um, and it's amazing to me how important that cycle is and how 
invariably we seem to put processes in ourselves that it sort of encourage a behavior that puts barriers between those two and it makes that round trip take a long time. So, uh, and really, uh, I think the, the big thing to me is that uh, there's a missed opportunity in that a lot of times the best ideas are the things that don't look like it at first. So, if there is no opportunity, like. Uh, for to be able to iterate and to be able to try things, um, then there's no opportunity for the designer to take, take risks, and there's no opportunity for the developer to take risks, and there's no opportunity for the magic that can happen from that. Um, a lot of the things that I am most proud of of being involved in in BlackBerry, BlackBerry Messenger, and the BlackBerry Splat included, came specifically from an interaction with a designer. The BlackBerry Splat was a discussion between designer and developer, um, where there was very big plans for what we wanted to be able to do um, that couldn't be made possible in software, but we were able to come together and get something that actually worked. Um, and it ended up being really successful. Um, so we should mention that yeah. just, you know, just alone working with uh, Cascades and designing for BB10 isn't necessarily going to fix <laughs> the problem with a, wa with a wand, but it does uh, because the design and uh, <coughs> some of the, the beauty and the aesthetic of the design is baked right in. You know, you can, you can tell when you're working with it that there was somebody very early on who thought design was important, and so good design sort of bubbles up in, in every aspect. Uh, that's not going to necessarily tell you, you know, how you should design your information architecture or what your user goals are going to be, but it is going to take those uh, those nice details that really make for a nice, smooth, fluid user experience, and they're, they're just taken care of for you. So uh, the flow that we were looking at there, it's not necessarily going to, you know, if you have a wall between your designer and developer, it cast, working with Cascades isn't necessarily going to break down that wall for you, but it is going to uh, help improve the iterations that you do, of course the best is to not have the wall and to sit right beside each other and actually iterate on it. Yeah. yeah. Actually, so and this, this is something that intrigues me. Mm -hmm. And uh, Megan and I were talking about this. But uh, it, uh, in my history, I've always, whenever I've worked with an interaction designer or a designer, um, I have tried to encourage them to use, to be closer to the tools that we actually use inside the code. I have, I spent a long time trying to get a, a designer to use SVG. Um, at the time, because SVG I thought was pretty straightforward, and the designer said, "No, I can't do that. That's code. I can't. Uh, I can't work in that type of format." Um, and that's always intrigued me because these are a lot of times these are designers who have figured out how to use tools like Photoshop, uh, which to me is far more complicated than a lot of time the co the code. Um, so this is something what intrigues me, and I think uh, when Megan and I were talking about this. There are a few things that have been evolving, um, some very major things that have evolved in terms of the platform that BlackBerry 10 exposes that while that can help break down the barriers between the two and help uh, establish a richer form of collaboration between the design and developer uh, in order to shorten that gap, to make it easier for um, to be able to make it easier for the designer and the developer to be able to interact, um, to be able to do quicker cycles, and most importantly, to leave room for that magic. Because um, like, the best ideas don't look like it at first. You need the opportunity to be able to take risks and to try things, to be able to make mistakes, make lots of mistakes, um, and often that's where the magic is. And without that sort of iteration, if if you have to formalize your idea before you have the opportunity to try it, a lot of times those best ideas won't get anywhere. Um, so there's a rich opportunity here. Some of the uh, key things, some of the, when I talked about enablers, some of the key, very key things in BlackBerry, like in BlackBerry 10, the things that are evolving, the things that I expect to continue to improve over time are things like a declarative UI, uh, the ability to be able to now in BlackBerry 10, you can drag and drop, and you can create a UI directly within the framework tools, and that's in QML. And while it used to be 
the round trip cycle time even for a developer to be able to take a new design or a new change to the UI and put that on top of existing code meant at least recompiling the code, making the code changes, recompiling it and putting it on the device. What I've seen happen in a lot of teams at RIM, the, the application development teams that are the most nimble, the most responsive, have formatted their code such that there's an underlying data service layer and they are leveraging QML. And when you leverage QML, that gives you the ability not only to be able to create a QML document, but to share that QML document, but also to, all you have to do if you want to make an update to your UI is to change the QML. You actually connect to the application and just change the QML, and then round trip times are much quicker. It gives you the opportunity to be able to take your design and make changes and to live with them a little bit. It gives you the chance to make quicker changes and to try it, um, to iterate back and forth much more quickly. And it, the other, and the, and some other enablers, and I, Megan, Megan has practical examples of this too, but uh, the rich set of controls that Megan mentioned too, it gives a common, because the, the design and the layout in the controls, a lot of l thought has been put into that. Though that set of controls builds sort of a common framework, a common language that can be used between in order to be able to facilitate and to be so you can start thinking about the application and what you're trying to do rather than uh, hopefully less about fonts and color and everything else and more about the interaction and what you're trying to do with it. Um, and of course the built-in UX and, de and design. And this is a key thing, this is a, a poignant thing for me, but uh, high resolution vibrant displays. Uh, we did a lot of speaking in the past on how to resize assets, resize parts of your screen, uh, dealing with different form factors. A real game changer over the industry the last little while is that we now have high resolution displays, so, um, and OpenGL, and vibrant full color, which means that uh, a lot of time, like there's less compromise, there's less thinking about what color reductions you're gonna do or, or how you're gonna resize images and largely images that look good, they all look good on a, a variety of different devices. And it takes, it's poignant for me because it takes a whole raft of design and graphics changes right off the table because you don't have to think about it as much anymore. I don't know if there's anything you wanted to add to that. I'll hand you over the clip uh, so you can continue examples, and make it real. <laughs> Thanks, Gary. Um, which one do I, there we go. So I think everybody, it's a fairly um, familiar quote, but it is still poignant to mention that, you know, all, a lot of the little elements of design, you really don't have to think about. So you can, as Gary said, focus on the user goals, focus on the complicated stuff to ensure that the users are actually able to complete what they set out to do. 